Okay. Let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for this day and for this time together. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with us. Help us to be better acquainted with your word and to understand it and understand how uh, we fit into the grand story of redemption and participate in the advancement of your kingdom. Help us now to think clearly about the book of Acts and the story of the early church. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, just as a very quick recap, we began this course, this New Testament survey course, by uh, looking at the background, the historical background to the New Testament. We looked in particular at Daniel chapter 11 and how the historical events that flow uh, out of that were actually real things that happened, right? Xerxes is that fourth king. Uh, he is overtaken by a Greek, Alexander the Great. Uh, Alexander's kingdom is divided into four, and the two main ones there are the Seleucids and kind of, you know, Syria, Turkey, modern-day Syria and Turkey, and then the Ptolemies are down in Egypt. Um, and uh, shortly after that, remember the Seleucids uh, just commit all these abominations uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, even in the temple, and this causes that big Jewish uprising, the Maccabean Revolt, and the Maccabees... Uh, led by Judas, uh, reign for about a hundred years. They have, uh, they have a a Jewish kingdom like they uh, kind of wanted, um, but uh, that kind of gives way to Herod. Herod uh, is the first kind of Roman Maccabean slash Maccabean ruler, and he rules uh, and does a lot of good things uh, in terms of building and architecture and things like that. But ultimately. Uh, suppresses the Jews in many ways as well. So that brings us basically up to the point of the Gospels, which we talked about last time. We looked at the four Gospels. We looked at why it is that there are four. Is it just uh, the fact that some of them are inadequate? Why don't we just have one comprehensive account? And uh, we spent a good, deal of, a good bit of time talking about that particular question, uh, and we answered it by talking about how each of the Gospels gives us a unique perspective on the life and the work of Jesus, but not just a different perspective, but an important kind of theological or fulfillment perspective. So, for example, uh, we looked at uh, the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. We talked about how it corresponds to the bull on the, face, the four faces of the cherubim, a bull was a sacrificial animal, uh, uh, and so we can think about how Matthew relates chiefly to kind of the law, chiefly to the priestly side of Israel's history. Um, and of course, that's exactly what we see, right? In Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, the longest, the, that's the longest account of the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus interacting with the law all the time. We see him saying that, uh, that he is the fulfillment of the law, and that not a jot and tittle will fall away. Most of that, and of course it's discussed in the others as well, but uh, primarily it is discussed at its greatest, greatest length in the gospel according to Matthew. Mark, though, remember Mark has a very different feel about it. It's much shorter. Uh, there's not a lot of the kind of the fluff, we could say. Jesus is depicted as a man of action. Jesus uh, is constantly on the move. Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem like a flint. Um, it's very interesting to see the differences here. And of course, this kind of helps us to think about Jesus as the new Davidic king. Israel's kings were men on the move, or at least they were supposed to be. They were supposed to go out and to fight and to conquer. Uh, and, um, and that's exactly what we see Jesus doing in the gospel according to Mark. And so the different perspective we get, if we think about Matthew, he is uh, he is a new Moses. He is a greater Moses. He fulfills all of the law. In Mark, we think about Jesus primarily uh, as this greater Davidic king who is a man of action going out to do all of the things that the Father has sent him to do. In the Gospel of the Luke, uh, according to Luke, uh, we have uh, more detailed accounts than any of the other Gospels of how Jesus and his people are to live among Gentiles. There's lots of financial uh, things that happen in the gospel according to Luke. 
uh, discussions and parables uh, about money that don't happen in the other Gospels. And so we can say that um, Luke is helping us to see this perspective of living among the Gentiles. Uh, he, we correlated this to the eagle on the faces of the cherubim. Uh, the eagle, remember, for Israel was an unclean bird. Any bird of prey was an unclean bird. And so it's a, lot of, a, a lot of the times it's associated with uh, that uh, time of exile or prophecy up to the exile where Israel is going to be taken from its own land and be forced to live among Gentiles. And then finally, that takes us then to the gospel according to John, which, of course, remember we talked about the difference between the synoptic gospels and then the gospel of John. The gospel of John is very, very different in its feel. Um, corresponds to the face of the man, of the, of the cherubim. And we might correlate it to that time coming out of the exile where Israel is anticipating this new covenant, uh, this new covenant that's going to be far greater than everything that has come before it. So it helps us, these four Gospels help us to see just how, just how uh, glorious and how kind of comprehensive uh, it was for Jesus to be, the, to be the Messiah. He wasn't just coming, you know, as to, fil to fulfill the law, although that was part of it, but it was just much more kind of fully orbed uh, and in an amazing picture. Well, that then, of course, brings us to the book of Acts. Uh, Jesus is the greater Moses in um, Matthew. He is the man who comes to fulfill the law. He's the uh, greater and the final Davidic king. Uh, he's the one who truly is going to bring about blessing to the nations, although that happens in a limited capacity before. Teaching, teaching God's people how to live uh, in uh, the midst of the Gentiles, and he is the new and, uh, uh, the new and glorious final Adam, uh, man that will uh, teach us how to live. So, uh, when we think then about the book of Acts, Remember that we need, to, uh, we need to remember that it is kind of the second volume of Luke's kind of comprehensive work. Uh, Luke writes the Gospel account, and then Luke also writes the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, so it's volume one and volume two, we could say. And I think last time we also talked about a lot of the different parallels that happen uh, between Luke and Acts. There's all kinds of kind of similarities in structure. We're not going to get into those uh, today. But actually, the very beginning of the book of Acts helps us to see this as a two-volume work. Chapter 1, verse 1 begins, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So here Luke is saying, in the first book, in volume 1, I talked about everything that Jesus did and taught uh, until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. That's very interesting here. Luke uses a word here in that first verse that he's never used before. Um, he uses, in fact, a different word to describe Jesus' ascension in the Gospel of Luke. He uses a completely different word. And it's likely that he is intentionally using this word to get us to think about uh, an account in 2 Kings chapter 2. In that chapter, Elijah is also taken up into heaven. He's taken up by a whirlwind. And this is the exact same kind of unique word that Luke uses. Well, why is this uh, significant? Well, if you recall, in thinking about uh, the story of Elijah, he doesn't just leave, but he actually commissions Elisha, and he gives him a dose of the Spirit as well, uh, to continue on his work. So it's likely that Luke is picking up on this exact same thing, that yes, Jesus has ascended, but he has also commissioned now his disciples to carry on his work. And all of this happens uh, here in this first verse. Uh, Acts begins with Jesus uh, being with his disciples, teaching them and explaining things to them, uh, telling them to not leave Jerusalem until they had received the Holy Spirit. And it does so by making kind of uh, reference to, um, uh, to that story in 2 Kings. But, shortly after that, Luke says that when they did 
when they did finally receive the Holy Spirit, when they received power from on high, when the Holy Spirit had come upon them, then these disciples would be witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, and to all the ends of the earth. That's how, kind of a paraphrase of verse 8. Um, there's a couple things we need to understand here about this verse. First, uh, notice the similarity in the language from Luke. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and made her with child, with Jesus. And now the Holy Spirit, is the exact same expression, the Holy Spirit is going to come, up, come upon the disciples who are waiting uh, for the promised Spirit. So there's a neat similarity there that, again, helps us to see this kind of volume one, volume two kind of layout of, uh, of Luke's writing. Secondly, F.F. F. Bruce, who's kind of a, uh, an English scholar in the mid-20th century, uh, he says that this verse here, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is kind of like the table of contents for the whole book of Acts. Uh, what you see is they're going to wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come, uh, and they will uh, be witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem and in Judea and then in Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly how the book of Acts is laid out. Uh, we'll get into all that here shortly. But the Holy Spirit comes. Peter and John, they preach primarily in Jerusalem. Uh, and then there's some kind of distinct markers that happen throughout the book. Philip goes to Samaria, uh, and of course, uh, Peter does as well. He leaves uh, kind of the surrounding area of Jerusalem. Uh, and then, of course, Paul goes to the ends of the earth. So you have right here in the very first several verses, in verse 8, you have kind of a layout for what's going to happen throughout the whole rest of the book. So the gospel is proclaimed, if we were to stick with that, and look at the first portion, the gospel is proclaimed in Jerusalem by the apostles. And here, I think we talked about this some last time, but, um, but the emphasis is primarily on Peter and John, and mostly Peter. Peter's the one that stands up and has his long sermon at Pentecost, but John is always with him. He's always mentioned as being with him. So these are Jesus's, you know, those who are very close to him. Uh, Peter and John minister and proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem, as we said, Philip and Peter go out into Samaria, and then Paul goes to the ends of the earth. So, if we think about this thus far, Jesus has ascended. Uh, he ascends there in the beginning of uh, Acts chapter 1. Uh, the disciples are kind of in, you know, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Uh, and that's exactly what happens when chapter 2 uh, begins. Uh, chapter 2 begins with the disciples all waiting together, kind of, you know, waiting, you know, hustled down in that uh, likely the same room where the supper was. There are 120 of them, and it is now uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, the Feast of Pentecost is uh, just kind of a newer name for the Feast of Weeks. It likely came about uh, in the maybe the two centuries prior to the coming of Jesus, uh, when the Greek language was a little bit more pervasive in Israel. So when we think about the Feast of Weeks and what that was and what that meant for the life of Israel, remember they had kind of three main festivals. Israel's calendar was governed by three main festivals. You first start off with Passover, and then at Passover, remember you have the Passover lamb and the feast and everything, but that's also the time when you purge all of the leaven from, from the midst of your house. And this kind of symbolizes uh, Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And they were kind of purging all of the old away, purging all the old Egyptian ways, we could say, away. Then new leaven is introduced. And this leaven takes time to, uh, to uh, you know, do its thing. I don't even know what the proper baking, maybe Micah can help me <laughs> uh, later. Um, it takes time to do its thing. And then the fullness, the seven sevens, Feast of Weeks, seven weeks, the fullness of that new stuff, that new leaven, is formed into loaves. And this is one of the only times where Israel can actually present loaves to God. Obviously, they didn't burn them on the altar. Uh, they were likely waved as kind of a dedication offering to God. And then the priests and the Israelite and the worshiper uh, could eat of them. 
So when we think about kind of, you know, the big picture of what's going on here, the old leaven of Egypt is being purged, new life, new life that comes from being God's covenantal people is introduced, uh, and that is celebrated, and it's kind of in conjunction with the wheat harvest, that is celebrated at the Feast of Weeks. That's what Pentecost was for Israel. So it's kind of like a maturation of the new life that you have with God being God's people. That's basically what the Feast of Weeks uh, was all about. Well, similarly, you know, when we think about how this corresponds to the church, why is Pentecost significant for the church? Well, it's not for those reasons, obviously, but those reasons help us to see, they form kind of a pattern for helping us to see how it does apply to the church. Jesus is the new Passover lamb. Uh, because of his death on the cross for us, we can truly have new life. We die to sin, we put away the old, the old ways of life, uh, and we put on new life. And that new life kind of uh, comes to a fullness with the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, at Pentecost, at the Feast of Weeks. So thinking about how the Feast of Weeks functioned for Israel helps us to see a little bit more clearly about Pentecost for the early church, and indeed for us as well. You have new life, but the Holy Spirit has to come and to, to equip and empower you to live that new life. For the early church, that was the case. Um, does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, so, the, uh, the new Passover has occurred. The Paschal Lamb of Christ uh, has been slain, and new life has been brought about uh, in the resurrection. And so now Pentecost is the fullness of that new life. Uh, with the coming of the Spirit. So the coming of the Spirit occurs on Pentecost. It rests on the 120 who are gathered together. Uh, a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind filled the entire house, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, you guys know this story fairly well, but evidently this, this uh, loud rushing wind from heaven was so loud that it gathered other people to say, what in the world was that? And so these people come, and they hear these 120 speaking in other languages, uh, being able to speak in other languages. Um, and of course, we all know, but it's important to emphasize that these were uh, true languages that were being spoken. You know, it, the, when you look at that text, it even, you know, it lists out all the nations, all of the devout people who lived there, or who were visiting there for the Feast of Weeks, Parthians, and you know, you got all these people, devout people from all over the world, who are there uh, to celebrate this feast, and they hear the gospel proclaimed in their own language. So these are uh, real languages, not, um, uh, you know, not any sort of gibberish or something like that. Um, now, one of the other things to notice here in this early part of the book of Acts is to see who heard their preaching. Verse 5 of, tap, of chapter 2 tells us uh, that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So every nation under heaven, in a, from a certain perhaps a representative standpoint, heard the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel was going out to all of the world, even at this very, very uh, early stage. Uh, and remember, so these were devout men, so these were likely devout Jews who were longing. Uh, perhaps they had heard about Jesus. Uh, perhaps they had already, uh, you know, placed some sort of trust in him. Um, and perhaps maybe some devout Gentiles as well, God-fearing Gentiles. Uh, that is indeed a possibility. But then, of course, um, many of them believe, but then, as you know, many of them, or many of the, uh, the Jews that had received the Holy Spirit, the believing Jews, uh, were mocked. And they said, well, they're just filled with new wine. They're drunk, basically. Um, and, of course, uh, this is not the case. And so Peter stands up, and he uh, preaches to those men from uh, those men from Jerusalem and Judea, the text says, uh, and tells them basically that you know that's not the case that they are uh, that they are actually 
have received the Holy Spirit. And he does so by kind of going through this amazing quotation of various Old Testament passages. So he looks first at Joel chapter 3. Then he looks at a psalm that talks about how Jesus dying and then being resurrected was a fulfillment of that psalm. And then he looks at Psalm 110, uh, showing that Jesus um, is the one that is being spoken of there, who, who then ascends and sits on the right hand of the Father. So he goes through all of these passages, basically saying that, uh, you know, everything that you've longed for happened in Jesus. Jesus was the one who was handed over to death, but was not abandoned. Jesus is the one who God the Father says, sit at my right hand. So he weaves together all of these Old Testament passages to these Jews in just a remarkable way, uh, basically to the point where you know they cannot resist him. You know, this is he's given them kind of the biblical foolproof, uh, you know, all all of the proof texts that you could need uh, in order to trust in the Messiah, um, and yet many of them don't. Many do, though. We're going to talk about that here shortly. Let me look at. Uh, let's look a little bit at the first citation that uh, Peter has, and this is from Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and and your daughters shall prophesy, and and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and on si- and signs on the earth be- below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And again, as you all know, sometimes this verse kind of gets applied uh, you know, to kind of a modern-day sort of fulfillment. Uh, I was kind of reared to think this way, at least for a time, where you think that, you know, if you're going to be saved, you've got to have all these visions and all this stuff. And really, when we look at this, how does, how does it begin? How does Joel 3 begin? And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And so Peter is citing this and saying that this is what just happened. That huge, loud noise that you heard, That's a fulfillment of Joel 3, Uh, and that's his fundamental and primary point here. Uh, That's what uh, what, uh, Peter is trying to do as he cites Joel. Um, Part of Peter's message uh, that he kind of sums up shortly after that is, "...to let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified." So that's the point of how... Uh, Peter cites this passage from Joel. Uh, All of these things that were spoken in the prophets, in the Psalms, uh, even in the Torah, all of these things are talking about Jesus being the Lord and being Christ. Uh, So that's the thrust of what Peter's message is. Now let me read to you, um, I've got the whole paragraph here, just because I think it's really, really remarkable uh, to hear this. So Peter has this really wonderful, elaborate sermon, and this is how it is received. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And then not too long after that, Peter continues preaching, and the number goes up to 5,000. I think this is just a remarkable uh, thing that sometimes we can perhaps uh, just not take note of. Uh, Maybe we're focused on other things, or maybe we do take note of it, but I think it's neat to see the success of the gospel early on, and that's a theme that happens all throughout the book of Acts. Yes, there's difficulties, there's executions, there's stonings, but the the gospel is advancing, and the numbers are multiplying and multiplying. 
and it's a remarkable, remarkable thing. So, uh, chapter four. In chapter four, uh, we see a lot of these, uh, a lot of this multiplication. The number goes up to five thousand. They're just in in a very short period of time. Well, then this brings up an issue for the apostles, right? They've got five thousand souls now that they have to minister to, um, and so that brings with it certain issues. In chapter 6, we hear this of this issue between uh, the Hellenists and the Hebrews. And, of course, these are believing Hellenists and believing Hebrews. Uh, but the point is, kind of ethnically speaking, uh, the Hellenists say that the Hebrews are the ones that are getting served by the daily distribution. So these are likely kind of the poor in their midst, uh, receiving kind of the daily sustenance that the, that the church was able to distribute. Uh, so their complaint is that the Hebrews are receiving their uh, daily distributions, but we Hellenists, we Greek Christians, are not. And as you all know, their uh, response, the apostles' response, uh, is that they can't, um, they can't, you know, do everything. They have to be focused on the ministry of the word and on prayer. Now it's interesting here. Some have suggested. And I think this is just a neat thing to think about, that uh, when we read this account in Acts chapter 6, although preaching is specifically mentioned, uh, it could also be that they were recording and writing the Gospels. Maybe that was the thing that the apostles really had to dedicate time to. It's really kind of a neat thing to think about. But nonetheless, even if that's not the case, they are teaching, they are preaching, that's what their job is, they're administrating, uh, administering the sacraments. Um, and that is what they have to be focused on. And they don't have time to necessarily, literally, they don't have time to necessarily be uh, involved in the daily distribution. And so uh, they encourage everybody who is gathered there to choose seven godly men to help with their uh, ministry, uh, and they choose the seven, these first seven servants. The Holy Spirit is with them as well. Uh, and even though they help with the daily distribution and in a lot of the, you know, the just helping out sort of thing, um, they are also preachers. Stephen just has this amazing long sermon that he gives as well. Um, and uh, uh, it's kind of remarkable, too, at the difference in tone from Peter's sermon at Pentecost and the way that he subsequently preaches and the sermon that Stephen gives. Let me read uh, the very end of... Uh, Stephen's sermon. It's a lot more kind of um, in your face to these unrepentant Jews. This is how he ends the sermon. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As, did, as your fathers did, so do you. And he had just laid out all the times that the Israelites had been hard-hearted towards God and rebellious. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Uh, when Stephen is stoned, this is how that section ends, uh, he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, megaphone I think is the word there, a loud voice, it's kind of neat, um, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then, of course, it just says he fell asleep, but he is stoned and killed. But, of course, you, you also remember the story. As this is happening, he sees the heavens open. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, uh, which, you know, is kind of a different posture. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, but now he's standing as if to receive Stephen uh, into, his, uh, into his presence. It's kind of a neat, uh, a neat picture. But I think there's a lot that we can think about and learn from here as we see Stephen's boldness and his faithfulness. You know, think about, you know, think about how much how much guts it would require to preach that type of sermon that he did to these unbelieving, unrepentant Jews. And he's very bold and as he does so, and he gets them right where they need to hear it. But then, what's his posture just as he dies? Just similarly to Jesus. Uh, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. So you see kind of a, a bold proclamation of the gospel, but then you see a true compassion on their actual souls, which I think is just um, a remarkable thing for us to consider. Okay, 
Um, so this kind of launches a new chapter in the church. The church has been, you know, hugely successful. Thousands and thousands of people are being converted. Uh, but now a persecution, uh, be, kind of beginning with Stephen. Peter and John have been in prison before, but they're released. But now we kind of go into this widespread persecution, uh, with uh, uh, kind of beginning with the stoning of uh, Stephen. And so there is kind of a hunkering down of some in Jerusalem, and then there's also a spreading out, right, of those, which is what Jesus tells them to do, go hide in the hills of Judea, basically. Um, and it's likely also that, uh, I, I guess um, we don't have too much hard data on this, but, uh, but that as they dispersed, they went as far away as Cyprus and way up into Turkey as well. Um, so they truly, when this persecution happens, they truly did flee. Um, so we're entering into this phase of persecution for the church, but then also uh, we're entering into the gospel going out to Samaria. Remember, so that's the second, kind of the second phase going all the way back to verse 8. The gospel, they will be witnesses to Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And it's here that Philip, uh, this, the name of the region Samaria is actually mentioned here as if to, as if to show that that's exactly what's happening, kind of referring back to, to verse 8. So Philip, just after Stephen is stoned, uh, Philip goes to Samaria and he converts um, uh, Simon the magician and of course he talks to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, the eunuch himself is likely, too, when we think about this, he's likely already a believing Gentile of sorts, right? He's got the scroll of Isaiah uh, that he's reading. He just doesn't understand, you know, what it, what it means, really. So he's likely a Gentile believer. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Philip goes to him there in Samaria, and he, um, and he explains the gospel to him. So the gospel is now spreading out into this uh, into this uh, farther uh, region. Uh, also, simultaneously to all of this, remember at the stoning of Stephen, Paul is there watching, likely, uh, and approving, and then he's kind of the guy that leads up the persecution against the Christians. Um, so all of this is kind of happening simultaneously. Um, Peter... So Philip is going to Samaria. Peter is too, and he's kind of uh, all. All the text says is that he's going from town to town, place to place. It's like he's visiting the churches and encouraging them and reassuring them and reminding them of what Jesus has said and to be faithful and that sort of thing. So that's what Peter's doing, uh, and uh, as he is doing so, he is summoned to Joppa. Joppa is on the coast there, to the north a little bit, uh, north of Caesarea. And uh, you, you all know the story. While he's there in Joppa, uh, he uh, is then summoned further on uh, to Caesarea, and he is uh, he has his dream of, you know, rise, Peter, kill and eat, eat all of these unclean animals. And of course, this is symbolizing now that there's now there's this huge kind of this huge thing that is happening in the history of God's people. Uh, God's people had all of these dietary restrictions that caused them to think about how they were to be separate, to be God's people, uh, to be faithful to Him. They weren't just kind of arbitrary rules. They were rules, uh, dietary rules that caused them to think about their holiness. Uh, there was a connection between this kind of ritual and what it caused them to think about morally. We talked about that uh, last, you know, in the, in the Lenten term uh, a little bit. So they're not just dietary rules. Uh, which is why God can change them. These, those rules were set for a time for Israel to teach them to be holy, to teach them to be set up people who are set apart. And now something new is happening. And so uh, he has this vision where he can rise and kill and eat uh, all of these animals, even these animals that were unclean before. Uh, of course, uh, kind of simultaneous to this, he goes up and he meets Cornelius, uh, Cornelius is, uh, you know, he's a Gentile, even if he was a believer, he's still a Gentile. Uh, Peter proclaims the gospel to him, and the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius. So there's really nothing that 
Peter can object to, right? He hasn't, uh, the Holy Spirit has done this. Uh, thankfully, thankfully it wasn't up to Peter because he would have probably gone back on things later. But the Holy Spirit does this, and Cornelius uh, clearly receives it. He and his family are baptized, uh, and this becomes a fundamental kind of paradigm shift for Peter, but then also as we think about the kingdom of God, too, comprising both Jews and Gentiles. So as we think about this, remember this was, this was, never, it was never the case that you know, Israel... Israelites were the only ones that were ever saved, clearly. There's example after example of Gentile believers. But this is certainly something new in terms of like the scope. Now the gospel is, you know, the, the dividing line uh, between Jew and Gentile is finally gone. And the thing that unites them is faith in Christ, right? There was even that, you remember, uh, in the construction of the temple, there was even that kind of knee-high wall kind of out in the courtyard. So believing Gentiles could come up to that Nehi wall, but they couldn't go past that, whereas Israelite worshipers could. So even if you were a believing Gentile, you couldn't, you couldn't come past that wall. And that dividing line in Ephesians 2, that dividing line is now being kind of finally broken down. Um, so we see now the gospel going, spreading into Samaria, uh, and we see that the persecution is in full swing. Uh, even James, the Apostle James, is killed uh, by uh, Herod Agrippa I. Um, and at this point, uh, Peter and John kind of fade off, and now Paul kind of takes the center stage of the story. Uh, he is converted on the road to Damascus, as we all know. Uh, and he and Barnabas... Uh, live primarily in Antioch. There's two Antiochs. This gets kind of confusing in the book, book of Acts. There's one in kind of Syria, and then there's one up in modern-day Turkey. Uh, they're distinguished uh, only by the one in Turkey. I think sometimes it will say synonymously Antioch Pisidia. So that's how you kind of know that there's two different ones. Right now, at this stage of the story, they're in Antioch in Syria, just kind of north of Israel uh, a little bit. Um, so that's where they are headquartered, and they leave Antioch in Syria, and they go on this first missionary journey, uh, first to Cyprus, to the island of Cyprus, and then kind of due north from Cyprus into Asia Minor uh, and Pisidia, and uh, that's where the second Antioch is, actually. Uh, so Paul, as he goes to all, all these places, he goes first to the synagogues, but then, you know, everybody can... Uh, everybody can listen to the things that he uh, has to say. But he goes first to the synagogues, uh, and he does kind of the same thing that Peter did uh, in his Pentecost sermon. He weaves together all of these Old Testament scriptures saying, the Jesus that you crucified, he is the Christ. There's no way that you can get around it. Uh, the Old Testament scriptures clearly point to Jesus, and Jesus is clearly uh, the anointed one. Uh, he, too, kind of like in Jerusalem, has a lot of success, uh, but he also has a lot of challenges as well. When he is in Lystra, uh, he is stoned uh, and <clears throat> uh, came very close to dying as well. Uh, so that's his kind of his a snapshot of his first missionary journey. He leaves Antioch, goes to Cyprus, preaching primarily in the synagogues, goes up to Antioch, uh, up through Asia Minor. Uh, doing the same thing, has a lot of success, a lot of people embrace the faith, uh, but then he also encounters a lot of difficulties as well. Well, so first missionary journey, he comes back to Antioch, and that's when he encounters the circumcision party. Uh, they, a group of them had, had you know, they're uh, faithful Jews, I guess you could say at the time. Uh, they're hearing the things that Paul says, but they say, well, yeah, but if you really want to be saved, you have to be circumcised as well. Uh, and uh, there became a huge confrontation between Paul and Barnabas and these uh, Judaizers, the circumcision party. Uh, the, way that it's, the way that it's characterized in the text is there was no small dissension between them. So there was a huge fight in between these guys. Uh, and rightly so, because this is something that is is a cardinal doctrine. This is something uh, 
that, of course, Paul's going to, you know, kind of flesh out in Galatians. Uh, but this is something that is truly at the heart of the gospel. Uh, circumcision is not part of the gospel. That binds you to the law and to Moses. Uh, you have been baptized into Christ. Faith in Christ is that thing that justifies us. And if you go back on that, then you're turning your back on the gospel, Paul says, basically. Um, but, interestingly, even though there's this huge argument, he still consents uh, to go back, likely with some of these other guys too, back to Jerusalem and to kind of get the advice and the ruling of uh, the other apostles. So they go back and uh, they uh, have the first council meeting, we could say, in Acts chapter 15. Uh, and they say, so what should we do about this? Uh, Paul here is saying, you don't need to be circumcised, but of course we have the law of Moses here requiring circumcision. And the apostles give their final answer to this question. They say, no, you do not have to be circumcised. Uh, that is not what justifies you. That's not what makes you part of God's people. It is faith in Christ. And so they... This is kind of this is you know the first kind of big apostolic decision, and it goes out. They send messengers to the various places throughout uh, throughout the area. Um, interestingly, and we don't know exactly too much about this. It gets referred to from time to time, but after this, Paul and Barnabas uh, split up. There's some sort of disagreement uh, between them. Barnabas goes with John Mark, and Paul pairs up with Silas, and so. Uh, Barnabas and John Mark go back to Cyprus, actually, and then Paul and Silas uh, are about to launch on their second uh, missionary journey. So their second journey goes up through Asia Minor. They go to all these places uh, in modern-day Turkey, all the, you know, uh, Cappadocia and Pergamum and all those places. Uh, they get referenced many times and receive letters themselves. And then they cross over. He is summoned to Philippi, so he crosses over, goes to Philippi, and that takes them then into Thessalonica and uh, Berea, remember the noble Bereans, uh, and then down to Athens and then over to Corinth. And then they eventually make their way back to Ephesus and then back down uh, to Antioch. That's kind of their, their headquarters in a certain sense. So if you think about that, though, that, you know, that only happens in a couple of chapters in the book of Acts. But there a whole lot happens there, right? Um, he goes through all the and plants all those churches basically out of the synagogues primarily in Asia Minor, um, and uh, plants churches in in uh, the the Philippians. Once he crosses over, he has his huge speech on the Areopagus where he's kind of you know debating these Greek philosophers. Uh, plants a church in Corinth and likely does the same thing. Goes back to Ephesus does the same thing, but he's imprisoned, and so he's there imprisoned at Ephesus for at least a couple of years. Uh, and it's likely while he's there at Ephesus that he has basically kind of like daily lectures where he is presenting the gospel, answering questions, uh, refuting certain things. So it's really kind of an amazing thing that just, you know, just gets covered in a couple of chapters in the book of Acts. But a whole lot happened, and this journey would have been uh, many, many years long three, four years, something like that. I guess we don't know exactly. Uh, but all of that happens on this second uh, missionary uh, journey. Um, when he comes back, though, he goes to Jerusalem and he visits James. So this is likely, well, we don't know exactly. James, probably the brother of Jesus. James the apostle, remember, is killed. He's executed back in chapter 13. So it's likely Jesus' half-brother, James, that he goes to visit. And while he's there in Jerusalem, he is, uh, he is arrested, and uh, you know, they, they take him to the various courts and tribunals. He goes to Felix, and he goes to Herod Agrippa. This is the second, uh, not the first. The first is the one that killed uh, James back in chapter 13. Uh, so he goes to all of these places, and he... Uh, kind of, you know, gets the runaround in many ways, faithful to God, and then he appeals to his Roman citizenship, uh, which they cannot uh, refute. And so uh, they send him then to Rome, and that takes us to, you know, we could say his third missionary journey, uh, even though it wasn't, you know, ex you know, he didn't intend for that to be the case. He is taken there as a prisoner. Um but, of course, while he's on the ship, he's 
still doing his same old missionary type stuff. Uh, somewhere, we don't know, know exactly where, obviously, somewhere in between Crete, which is, you know, kind of southwest of Cyprus, and then the little island of Malta up north towards Italy, somewhere in there, of course, uh, they have their shipwreck, uh, and they, you know, they fi finally make their way up to Malta, uh, and then he's at Rome. And while he's in Rome, of course, he's under, under guard, just like he is at Ephesus, but while he's in Rome, uh, he does kind of the exact same thing. He goes and he visits the church there when he can, uh, and, uh, and he talks to them daily. And it says, that, uh, this last part of Acts tells us that uh, he lived on his own at his own expense for two years while he is uh, teaching and exhorting and encouraging uh, these Roman Christians. And so that's how uh, the book ends. Uh, of course, we don't get a lot of detail uh, about uh, what happens after that. Um, but it's just a remarkable story of the early church. We see them kind of waiting in anticipation for the promise of the Holy, the promised Holy Spirit to come. It comes upon them just like it came upon Mary uh, with Jesus. They are equipped at this, this time that is the fullness of new life, uh, and we see them uh, living out this new life through the preaching of Peter and John. Uh, and and making you know thousands and thousands of disciples, a remarkable, remarkable thing. But then persecution strikes, um, and they are kind of scattered, at least to a degree. Um, and the gospel then goes to Samaria, uh, and we see uh, various people who live in Samaria, or at least traveling through Samaria, receiving the gospel, being converted. The Holy Spirit is now being poured out on these Gentile believers. And then finally, uh, we see the gospel going to the ends of the earth with the Apostle Paul. Uh, obviously not you know, the actual ends of the earth, but he goes a pretty long way. And he, uh, he interacts with all kinds of people, Jews, Gentiles, Greek philosophers. Uh, he almost tackles it all and interacts with everybody. And so we can see truly then that that verse 8 truly coming to fruition. The gospel is... This multiplies greatly in Jerusalem. It goes to Samaria. It goes to the end of the earth. And the church is enormously successful, even in spite of all of the difficulties that it has to go through. Um, so I think it's a wonderful, kind of encouraging story, too, to think about how successful it was uh, when they were fearful of the Lord, but also comforted by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that combination of two things gets brought up two or three times in the book of Acts because they feared the Lord and because they were comforted by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I think that's exactly the exhortation that we need to have today. We have to fear God, and that, that enables us to be bold and to live faithfully. And then we remember that we're comforted by the Holy Spirit when hard things do come. Uh, and uh, that's the promise that we have, and that's the commission that we have. Okay, so that takes us right to 7 o'clock. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, were there many Christians in Turkey around that time? That's a very good question. Um, well, of course, I think you know, it's hard to say many. Uh, there were certainly a lot of churches as a, as a result of um, uh, people hearing about Jesus, both at Pentecost and then through the missionary activity of Paul. But then at the same time, you know, it's hard to say too much because a lot of these churches were probably pretty small churches, you know. They weren't like our big churches, likely. Uh, so there were a lot of churches, but we don't know exactly how big they are, uh, big they were, and many kind of speculate that they were, you know, on the smaller side. Um, that's, yeah, that's a good question, though, to think about um, how big, how many there actually were at that time. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that people are losing their consciousness? Do you think it's that community of Emmaus believing in Jesus and then they just kind of fall away? Yeah. Yeah, I would say kind of a combination. Uh, 
probably reading into the text a little bit too much because, you know, this is a kind of a peculiar thing. The Apostle Paul has a special mission set, and we shouldn't, we should be really careful to kind of apply that, you know, to today, to us who are not apostles, right? Um, and, and it also kind of goes against, you know, the numerous exhortations to live peaceably with your brother and, you know, how, how good is it to dwell, uh, you know, uh, with with your brother, uh, I suppose you could make kind of a small application, maybe, and say, you know, okay, we have a difference of opinion here. Let's not, you know, make it a, make it a big issue. We might divide a little bit on this particular thing, as long as you're still kind of united around, you know, you're still brothers, you're not out of fellowship with one another. But it seems like that sort of thing kind of happens, you know, uh, in in some senses. Uh, yeah, you know, we all probably have acquaintances where we are not completely on the same sheet of music on various things with people. And so we kind of allow for some small division to take place as long as we're still, you know, truly in fellowship with one another, I think. Yeah. I'll probably stick to that, I guess. Yeah. Anything else? Good question. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word and the story of the early church and how it encourages us to be faithful to you and bold, uh, but also, Lord, to be reminded of your promises and the comfort that we have uh, uh, through the Holy Spirit, knowing that you are in control of all things and uh, that you uh, care and support and provide for us in all situations. Help us now, Lord, to go out into the world throughout the rest of this week to uh, live like this early church, fearing you and being comforted. Help us uh, to love one another and for that to be a mark to the world of uh, something that uh, is unique, that is, uh, uh, cannot happen without faith in you and, uh, and um, unif the unification of the body. So help us to remember those wonderful things, Lord, and to live that way. Keep us safe this evening, help us to sleep well, and uh, help us to uh, be diligent in all the tasks that you have given us, knowing that everything that we do is uh, good and uh, pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.